Well, thank you for inviting me to come, and thank you all for coming. This will be a, uh, a session devoted really to special topics within the discourse, <coughs> not to attempt to cover the discourses as a whole. As a matter of fact, we had a nine-day uh, seminar on the discourses earlier this year, up in, in last month in uh, Mirana, and even <coughs> 16 sessions. <laughs> It's not even remotely enough to cover the discourses as a whole. I think you'd probably need to have <coughs> 50 or 100, something like that. So uh, these will be selected topics within the discourses. Of course, these are books that are, are well known to the Bible world, and I dare say most or all of you have read them, and some of you have read them and studied them many times. So uh, uh, feel free to chime in, ask questions, bring up points as we go. Don't stand on ceremony, or if you're seated, don't sit on ceremony either. <laughs> Just freely take part in this, uh, in this uh, process. Um, the topics we have, in fact, <clears throat> see if, is there another copy to hand out? Or? There you go. Oh, okay. Sure. Just, uh, I need to have them on here. In fact, I do. Just to take a look at what's upcoming. Uh, this morning is going to be on the history of the discourses, of course. Um, this afternoon, Maya and the nature of reality. Um, this is actually a very big topic in Baba's philosophy, Baba's metaphysics. The next, uh, tomorrow morning, is going to be on the ego and the... Uh, Actually, at Marana and Denver and other places, we did a whole, in fact, at Briarcliff, we had uh, six sessions on the ego. There's a lot I would have to say about that. Yeah. Having a very most excellent ego myself. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of new material. So I'm just going to give a little bit, a little bit of some of the high points of a, of a greater discussion. And then uh, tomorrow afternoon uh, on good and evil dichotomy of good and evil or morality. And all these things, there's a discourse on that. That will be the centerpiece of this discussion. But we just had a meeting up in the Bay Area on this, and I think this is quite a useful and significant topic within the Baba world. I find in the modern world a lot of um, confu confusion on this topic. Okay, then next week, um, the new humanity and social formulations on the what about, about communities, community values, and politics, and uh, what Bob has said about it, those sorts of topics. That, af that afternoon, Saturday, will be the heart and the head, the heart and the mind. Um, and, okay, I'll reserve further comment until then. And Sunday morning, love and the divinization of daily life. You know, Nashawan had asked me to do a, a, what you call an intensive earlier this year on... Uh, why do we suffer? Yeah. And at the end of it, um, the logic of the whole thing naturally led me to the topic of love. And I've always been kind of afraid of discussing love because what do you say about it? It's like sort of you gush at each other or sing songs about Baba. But I did find, you know, we, what we'll wind up doing, what I wound up doing was saying, hey, let's take some of the great love songs look at the lyrics, and it turned out to be quite a bit of fun, I thought. So, and then that Sunday afternoon, as I dare say you know, there'll be a, uh, something, there'll be a uh, performance with little moments and excerpts from the play that was done at Nirana for the New Life, and uh, all the musical, uh, music we did for it. Um, Greg and Gay Dunn will be coming down, uh, the Choi Boys will be joining some of you here to do... It's fantastic. Yeah. It was fantastic. It was really a fabulous thing. It really was. So um, I had a, had a blast. I've been involved in a lot of the plays at Narbad. But, you know, this was rather different because it was, it's not actually a play. It's almost like um, a chronicle of the new life. And I thought it was really, really uh, charged. I know a lot more about the yes. new life than I did yeah, yeah. before. Yeah, you were there, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wasn't it wonderful? It was just wonderful. I mean, when it's like that, it's because oh, my Bob. Energy. Yeah, because Baba is there. So I guess all this will culminate 
in the new life. And then on Sunday afternoon after the performance, we can all go out with our beggars' bowls and caravans <laughs> and donkeys and embark on the new life. What if Dr. Ghani is there? Huh? Dr. Ghani? He's in India. It was played by Mark Choi, but, but I think... Uh, I thought he did well. Who's I don't know who's going to be doing Ghani now. I have been assigned that role. Yes. Oh, you're Ghani. Yes. Okay, okay. Maybe I should shave my beard. <laughs> That's right. You can keep it. You can keep it. That's actually probably the leading role. He's such a character, but anyway, I'll hold off on that. So this morning, let me just read through what is you'll find in your handouts about uh, the history of the discourses, and then I want to say a little more about why uh, approach that topic at all. We begin with a review of the textual history of discourses which opens with their original publication in the Mirababa Journal between 1938 and 1942, continues through the five-volume set, 1939-43, God to Man and Man to God, 1955. That was edited by Charles Purdon. Yes. The three-volume sixth edition, 1967, and the seventh, the seventh edition, 1986, and culminates with the revised 6th edition, 2007. And this is this one. Is this your, your copies, Aaron? Yeah. Is it? Okay. Um, this, which is a, basically a reprint of the 6th edition with other supplemental material at the back. What does the fact that Baba arranged for the editing and re-editing of his words so many times suggest about how we should understand them? Should we take the avatar's words as sacred scripture, as the Bhagavad Gita, Gospels, and Koran have been regarded in the past? Main topics, a textual history of the discourses, organization and content uh, of the collection, and on the status of Mirabhava's published words. Um, so I wanted to say something right at the, on the front end on this uh, first topic about um, what Baba's words are, or uh, some of the, I won't even say that, I'll say some of the questions we might ask in approaching them in view of what the avatar's words have been in past ages. And I'm going to change to another slideshow here. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, I think that uh, the question of Baba's words and their role uh, in the life of Baba's lovers generally and of Baba's community, the, the Baba community, um, arises now uh, in a new way, more emphatically than it did in the past. Uh, at least in my own personal observation or experience, I find this, uh, because of the passing of the Mandali era. Yes. And, you know, there haven't been um, many of Baba's immediate disciples left in the West for some time. Um, I mean, uh, Phyllis was a close, you know, disciple, a follower of Mayor Baba, Kitty, Elizabeth, Margaret, those people... They've all been gone for quite some time. But despite that, it seems to me that our, for the most, I mean, allowing that each person has his or her own approach to Baba, it has been the character of <clears throat> um, the style, the general regime, you might say, has been greatly influenced by the Mandalay <clears throat> and their emphasis on be natural, don't, you know, just be close to Baba, love Baba, obey Baba, a sort of a family Baba. Baba is intimate, yeah. Baba is your friend. And uh, uh, one hopes that that will be permanent, permanently established in the heart of his lovers. But the fact is now that the people who met him are almost all gone. I mean, there's a gal, there are a handful, there are a handful of people from our generation too. But in the main part, um, it's Baba's lovers never did meet him personally. So naturally, the question arises, how do I approach him? How do I get closer to him? 
I mean, for anyone, this would be so. And one answer that comes right off the bat is, well, God is within me, and I approach him within me. And I take that simply to be true. And that will always be true, and that will always be the root of it. It is for me. Um, at the same time, most human beings need means of one sort or another, like God within me, well, who is that? How, mm -hmm. how do I find that? How do I approach that? So it's only natural to say, well, I'm going to read about Baba's life. What did he do? Oh, look at what he said to so-and-so. Um, uh, look at, read the story of the new life. Do I have something to learn for this, from this? It's only natural to approach means of one sort or another. Now, one of these means would be um, his photograph or his image for people who feel, you know, that's a love channel or an important route, or singing songs to Baba or poetry to Baba or praise or prayers, things like that. Um, uh, Baba's life story, that's another big one. And another one, big one is Baba's words. And I think that always in the past has played a huge role for the followers of the Avatar. I mean, look at... Um, in Islam, the most recent advent, look at the Quran. Of course, that's attributed not to Muhammad, but to Allah himself. But mm -hmm. same thing to me. So look at the role the Quran has played in the life of billions of people. The Gospels, the Christian Gospels, the Buddhist Sutras. In Hinduism, look at the, the Bhagavad Gita, the role that that's played. And it's magnificent work, the Ramayana, all these things. In every past <laughs> advent, it appears that whatever God accepted as the words of the avatar has had a colossal influence on civilization. I mean, there's really no other works, very few anyway, um, that would belong to the same category. I suppose in China, say the Tao Te Ching or the Amalekites of Confucius might have an influence you could compare with it. There's not much. So I would suggest and submit that the same is inevitably going to be true of Baba's words. Because let's suppose somebody comes, all right, Aaron, you've come to hear about Baba recent, fairly recently. I suppose most of the other people here have for, for a longer time. But you're coming to Baba and you say, well, what does Baba want of me? And you go to someone and the person preaches at you. <laughs> and you say, maybe not to their face, but to, I might say to myself, Okay, but why should I believe you? You know, I mean, I believe that you're telling me what you think would be so, but why should I accept that for my own part? Ron, have you come to Baba for the recent year or a long time? Your time? Um, 12 years. Oh, that's a while. Minute. How, you, how long have you been with Baba? Three years. Three years. Oh, okay. That's okay. Anyway. I don't want to presuppose anything about anybody, but. Um, so some people are, you know, in the last few years, some for longer. But I think for everybody, what do I believe? What do I believe? And a place to go is, well, what did Baba say? Don't give me your stuff. What did Baba say, right? Isn't this a natural question for people to ask? And one first answer to give to that, if you want to be literal about it, is that Baba didn't say a darn thing. He was silent. Okay. So, but we have lots of books that have been published with Meher Baba's name on them, as if he was the author. So, I mean, I'm bringing up a big question. What, what do we take these to be, these discourses? Can, are they his? Can yes. we trust them to be his? And humanity is going to ask this big time. Like there's some people who say, well, this is by Dr. Deshmuk, right? Or uh, the everything and the nothing is by Francis Brabazon. Or God Speaks, I don't know, by Erich. I mean, I'm being kind of extreme here. But it's actually a valid question. What, it, in fact, is the standing of these works? Now, in the past, I'm trying to bring this up as a question that I think is really going to be important for the Baba world. It hasn't been asked very much yet. Uh, Baba's lovers have, the general approach by the Mandali is a kind of a simplicity of 
heart and faith in him. And that really will carry you, carry one through anything. And if you have that, you really don't need anything else. But um, people are going to ask all of this. Well, why should, is this Baba's? Um, I remember one word in the discourses, um, an abacadarian, you know. Well, is that really Baba's word or is that Deshmukh's word? I would bet 10 to 1 it's Dr. Deshmukh's word. It's in the discourses. So can we, how, how much faith can we have in it? I'm just raising this as a question on the front end, <clears throat> as a way of introducing our topic for this morning, actually. So, in, word, word, you yeah. say we can interrupt. Yeah, I please, the, the not interrupt. The unusual word that you just cited, yeah. and I've always pronounced it as abacadarian. Is it abacadarian? It's, it's an ABC or Right. Well, I've never heard it pronounced before, yeah. except by me and now by you. Okay. I never yeah. saw the word. <laughs> yeah. It's a nice word. It's it, a good it, word. It's, uh, it, it's from ABC. An abecedarian is someone who's in the ABCs of a subject. That's right. Okay. Isn't it a great word? Yes. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, my feeling is it probably came from Deshmuk. And <laughs> Baba asked Deshmuk to edit and write up these things, and Baba's stamp is on it. So I take it as Baba's word through Deshwa, personally, <laughs> just jumping to an immediate response to this bigger question. But, um, you know, in the past, here's, let me just uh, illustrate. If I, here we go. May Don't, I uh, answer a little bit to your question? Mm -hmm. And we'll be saying a lot more about it as we go on. Uh -huh. Okay. If somebody comes across and asks me those questions, my answer would be, I mean, that's just my understanding of Meher Baba, that Meher Baba as avatar of the age in this advent, his role is different. He's a silent master. Mm. So these books and these discourses, yes, have been dictated by him, either by a silent gesture, alphabet word, or so. However, mm. the reason I have a faith that is his because many times, word when I read it, his mm. divinity through those words are revealed right. to me. Mm -hmm. So it can't be anybody who has that much God's consciousness yeah. that he has. That would be my answer. Mm -hmm. Well, that will be a lot of our topic this morning. I certainly accept these as Baba's words for my own part. But let's let's delve into this somewhat. And the discourses okay, sure. really provide us with a good example. Now, I just wanted to illustrate in the past the kind of um, uh, faith that has been placed in Holy Scripture as this has been conceived in the different religious traditions. So a uh, question I'm asking is, are the discourses Holy Scripture? Okay, I'm not giving a quick answer to it, but I'm raising the question. Just to illustrate, this is from St. Augustine, who I gather was a six-plane saint. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, let me read just a little bit. He's, this is from his Confessions, mm -hmm. and he's talking about the opening of Genesis, the book of Genesis in the Bible. Let me hear and understand, he's talking to God here, let me hear and understand the meaning of the words, in the beginning you made heaven and earth. Moses wrote these words. Now he's, this is in Latin, and of course the, the Bible was in Hebrew, which he didn't know as a matter of fact. He wrote them and passed them on in your presence, meaning God's presence, leaving this world where you spoke to him. He is no longer here, and I cannot see him face to face. But if he, this is Moses, were here, I would lay hold of him, and in your name I would beg and beseech him to explain these words to me. I would be all ears to catch the sounds that fell from his lips. If he spoke in Hebrew, his words would strike my ear in vain, etc., etc. Look at how passionately and deeply concerned he is about the meaning of these words in the beginning he made heaven and earth. And he's going to go on to explain some of his questions. Look at how seriously he's taking that one phrase. I'm quoting St. Augustine as one of innumerable people who took every word in the Gospels or in the Bible, in the Torah in this case, um, as the word of God. Here's another example of the same thing. We can see it all over the world. Um, you may not know of 
this work. I don't know. Are some of you acquainted with the great Adi Shankaracharya? Is his name? Um, I've recently heard and have been persuaded by an article by Peter Rowan in Australia that um, <coughs> he was a minor incarnation of the Avatar. I've heard that before, but Peter persuaded me in this article that Baba said that uh, in Elizabeth and Narina. So this is the Avatar himself. So I'm just going to give you a, you won't read any of this, but okay. This is the opening of the Brahma Sutra. Thereafter, hence a deliberation on Brahma. That's uh, what he's commenting on. Now look at how much he has to say about that phrase. <laughs> There's all of this. There's all of this. There's all of this. <laughs> all of this up to here. That's how much a perfect, a God-realized soul has to say in commentary on that much Sanskrit. Look at the seriousness with which he takes it. This is a minor incarnation of the avatar doing it. And I've read a lot of Shankara, and uh, <clears throat> he always takes it as a given that everything and anything in Holy Scripture is absolutely true. Mm. And it's just a question of understanding. Okay, in Ibn Arabi, with, or many other people in Islam, the Quran was taken as the word of God. Um, Confucius and Lao Tzu, it's a bit different. They weren't taken as, you know, God men or anything like that. But their works have been treated in the same way. All over the world, for thousands of years, this has done with sacred scripture. With Baba's words, are we dealing with that? Is that what we're talking about in this case? How are we to take Baba's words? And let me just jump to this uh, one comment Baba did make about this. Let me see if I can slide 51. This is from Early Messages to the West. Baba had an interview in London with James Douglas um, and got reproduced in Early Messages to the West if you want to see it. So, and this is Chanji's version, <coughs> Chanji in his diary recorded a fuller account of it, and uh, James Douglas published a shortened version in the newspaper. What is your silent message or special discourse? Elimination of the ego. Your desire, you desire sal salvation of mankind. Have you any Bible, Quran, or some such book of revelation, right? This is the only case I can think of where anyone... We have a re on record. David, are you aware where Baba ever got asked this kind of question elsewhere? I can't know. I can't think of another case exactly. I haven't really looked through Lord May here for it, but okay. Baba says, though I give discourses and people take me to be a teacher, I do not give much importance to superficial book knowledge and learning because I awaken the latent divinity within. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't yes. exactly seem to be saying yes, no, does he? No. It's, it's not a no either, but he's emphasizing book knowledge is not the real knowledge that he comes to give. Which book is he, uh, is he re referring to? Bible, Quran? I think he's referring to any kind of knowledge derived from a book. So it would apply to those two. But the question was, um, have you in Bible, Quran, or Book of Revelation, guys saying, have you given up something like this? And Baba is saying, I don't give ultimate importance to the kind of knowledge that you can record in a book. Okay. I don't think he's knocking these things. I don't read it that way. But if the ultimate truth is not there. So it does suggest to me um, that the role of books in the future is going to be a bit different than it has been uh, in the past. I could say a lot of my field of specialization was actually oral tradition and its movement into literate tradition, but uh, um, so I could talk a lot more about that, but I won't for the moment. I'm just, so I'm raising this question, what will be the role <coughs> in Baba's books? And I feel if we want to talk about this in a meaningful way, which will surely come up in the Baba world more and more and more, 
One of the first steps is to know something about how these books arose and how Baba created them over the course of time. Thus, the topic this morning, a history of the discourses. That's really our topic. That's a reason to know about this, how these books came into existence. This is a preface. Any questions or comments at this, this stage? You see what the question is? Like when we read these, can we believe them? And how do we take them exactly? Okay, let me give one other example. I've been working for years now on this book collection called The Tiffin Lectures. These are talks Baba gave in 1926, 1927 to his mandala. It's like um, the spiritual training of the mandala, you could say. Okay, we're going to be publishing it, and all of this will be explained. And the author is Meher Baba, who's the source of this material, and that case is thoroughly made within the book. However, a number of these talks, the evidence would suggest that Baba gave them in Gujarati, and we're publishing them in English. <coughs> Obviously, these are not literally Baba's words, no are they? If he spoke in Gujarati and not English, but we're publishing them in English. So this is another illustration of this question. You know, <clears throat> how are we to approach this, and how are we to take it off? Ward, can I interject one thought? Yeah. You know, when you asked if Baba had addressed that question, he hadn't. I'm not thinking of the question of do you have a scripture, but one really relevant thing is where, in talking about God speaks, Baba did say certain things, especially that. Uh, at, at some point, he told someone, I don't have the quote in front of me, but I've seen this recently. Uh, he said that he worked with these words directly, and that it's kind of like he put an atom bomb in them, that, that when you read yeah. them, you, you get. So that's, that's, a, that's another part of a sort of counter-argument in a sense. It is. Yeah, yeah Don Stevens would say that. Yeah. <clears throat> Baba had said there are atom bombs in them. And I'm a big believer in the atom bombs. <laughs> I buy the atom bomb theory. Yeah. It seems like when I'm reading them, they're going off with regularity. Um, yes, and another letter to uh, Don, as I recall, Baba said that in the future, people would take God speaks to be the word of God. Um, so there's that side to the question, too. I ultimately do embrace that view myself. That's ultimately what my position is. But there's a lot to be said about it, or a lot to be asked about it. So here's jumping now in then to a history of the discourses. If I can find my proper slideshow on this. Here we go. <coughs> Lord, let me add, add, add one other subject, too. Yeah. There's also the subject of Baba's book that he wrote with his own hand. Yes, and that's, that's right. That's an interesting side note on the same theme, because, right. because he repeatedly said when people read this book, yeah. you know, he, I mean, he treated it in the same way. In fact, I think he did specifically say that it was like his scripture. And... And then he said it'd be like the Avesta, the yeah, Quran. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that does address that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Right. And we do have in Baba's own handwriting the book in God's hand. That we don't have a copy of it right here, do we? But some of you would know it. It was uh, in Baba's own handwriting, thirty-nine pages. So here's a question. I mean, in the future, people who are new to Baba or skeptical of Meher Baba are going to look at that and say, "Hey." He crossed out words. <laughs> if he's infinite knowledge, why didn't he get it right the first time? <laughs> like that. Or else um, he misspelled words. If he's <coughs> infinite knowledge, why didn't he use his divine spell checker? You know, things like that. I mean, in a way, they seem like stupid questions, but there, there's a point there. You know, how are we going to look at this? How are we going to look at this ultimately? And this question will come up with, it appears to me, just about every book of Baba's, or I'll say the major ones that I know of, anyway, that Baba had them published under his name and then had them revised. So, you know, somebody who had a very kind of literalistic idea of what infinite knowledge is, I take Baba to be infinite knowledge. 
And yet, he <coughs> seems to have misspelled the word infinite <laughs> with regularity. He would spell I-N-F-I-N-A-T-E. Okay, and some people will say, well, maybe that's the true spelling. <laughs> okay, but I mean, if one wants to go that way, that's I don't care very much. But I don't think we have to um, make excuses for Baba. He was a man also, and had a human mind, and uh, had a divine mind and also a human mind, and would walk, work through a human process in bringing these books to expression. So, uh, an edition of the Discourse of God Speaks, we found this out about God Speaks, um, that he was going to have them re-edited by Francis Brabazon. He wasn't satisfied with the, the form in which they took. So, uh, again, people are going to ask, if you take him to be God in human form, why did he keep re-editing his own works? Okay, we can come more to this towards the end of it, but let's get some of the actual history now of the discourses, which is when, so that there's a foundation of knowledge when we approach questions of this sort. I want to talk about the discourse, the precursors to the discourses. Um, I won't say much about it, because these are huge topics in themselves, but in uh, uh, the 1920s, uh, from the establishment of Maribad until near the end of the decade, um, Baba really gave out a lot of discourse material. And the evidence to me suggests that um, the Mandali were working towards publishing it. Um, but it didn't get published at that time. So here are some of the things that came out. Of course, there's the book. We started dictating that on 13th July, 1925. Anything strike you about that date? Yeah, after he started his silence. On the 10th of July, mm -hmm. three days before. Right after he began his silence, he began writing this book. Hmm. And he finished it in November or maybe December 1926, does anything strike you about this date? This isn't quite so obvious, but do you know what happened like about the 2nd of January 1927? He stopped writing. Yeah. And he started, and for about four or five days, they were like, well, how the heck are we supposed to know what you're saying, Baba? And Baba would point to letters in the newspaper, and then they came up with the idea of an alphabet board. So the book was written exactly during the period when Baba was writing. And you know what he would do is he would have a, a slate and chalk. And I imagine him being very kind of fast and impatient and sloppy about it. And uh, somebody would be reading it and would read it out. And uh, I would guess, I mean, we don't have any descriptions of this process that I've ever seen. But I would imagine Baba would write enough and then somebody like Chanji would read it and maybe know where Baba was going and finish the sentence and Baba might look up and nod and go on to the next thing. I, I would imagine Baba sort of did it that way, sort of shorthand something. When a slate was done, um, it would be passed aside and he would be given a new slate. And maybe the slate would get passed on. Actually, Chanji might have been the secretary, it might have got passed on for him to write down, help him in writing records. And he'd get a new slate, and there'd be a stack of new <clears> slates. And when Baba was done, somebody would clean them and give them back. So that was the kind of process that got used for a year and a half there, when Baba was um, giving anything substantial. Most of the time, you know, Baba, you know, my, I mean, I can't, you know, Mani could imitate him so well, but like, do you want something? Or, you know, how's your health? Or, you know, a man for tipping a hat or woman bangle or I mean I imagine even in those days he could express himself without having to bother to write stuff out. But if he needed to say anything more he would write it out in a slate. So a lot of this stuff was created that way. Um, over this period he actually wrote it. Um, and if he didn't wasn't writing the book, he'd be writing on a slate somebody would give it out as a discourse and then Chanji or someone else would take notes. So we have in God's hand 39 pages. Um, it's there are some reasons to suppose it might have been written by Baba in August of 1925. You know, in January of 25, Baba 
uh, settled in at Mirabad for the first long stay and was there for about 18 months or so. Infinite intelligence, uh, it seems to me there's a lot of evidence that it was uh, dictated by Baba March to July 1926. The Tiffin lectures I just mentioned, which will be published next year, uh, are all dated. We know the exact dates from the 29th of April 1926 until um, August 30th, 1927. The next book after that will be Sri's Explanation on Creation in the Universe, talks he gave to the Mir Ashram boys. These are really mind-blowing talks. And there was a public, and by the way, uh, there are a lot of indications uh, <clears throat> with the Tiffin lectures in particular, but other things too, that the Mandali were actually meaning to publish these as books, that, that the material is being compiled. Um, and probably it was going to be given, there's a letter by Adi to Phyllis Frederick, right? She, she had a lot of the material actually for Tiffin lectures, sent to her by Adi. And uh, uh, Adi said to her that Dastur, KJ Dastur, was going to edit it in for publication. He was the editor of this magazine, the Mayor Message. Are you are you acquainted with the Mayor Message? It was um, a monthly magazine, the earliest magazine uh, in Baba's name that was published. It was like 80, 100 pages each issue every month. And it was edited by one of his disciples, K.J. Dastour. But the problem was that in 1931, Dastour defected from Baba and started denouncing Baba, actually. Um, the story is that he was um, a bit offended that Baba didn't take him to Europe when mm -hmm. Baba went. You know, that was kind of... You know, it's funny, at the very beginning, all the Mandali would have loved to go with Baba to Europe. But after he'd done it four or five times, <laughs> they would have turned tail like Roadrunner and <laughs> gone the other way because it was so difficult. And Baba gave such a hard time to the Mandala who accompanied him. But anyway, Dastur fancied himself as Baba's leading disciple and was apparently quite offended and uh, wound up denouncing Baba. So I think that has something to do with the fact that all of this material got left, got dropped, you might say, and has been kind of buried um, until recently. Like Mayor Message, there are a lot of uh, articles attributed to Mayor Baba and the Mayor Message, and Baba lovers really don't know anything about it for the most part. Very few people have read it or know about it. So it seems that this whole dispensation of the 1920s, Baba's wish was for it to lie latent, for almost a hundred years, it appears. But it was a whole revelation by the avatar of the age. This is the earliest phase of his discoursing, would be at this period. Now, in the 1930s, I'll just, this, um, when Baba went to the West, uh, he gave messages, um, especially in 1932, uh, there are six major messages. They're not very long, but they're very significant and really, really immortal messages. He gave two of them right out here in Los Angeles, as a matter of fact. And uh, actually, there is a funny story about how uh, the messages in Los Angeles were composed. I don't know if you're familiar with Meredith Starr, Baba's disciple Meredith Starr. He was... Uh, one of the first, very first, Western disciples of Mir Baba. And he had an inflated um, idea of himself. And uh, <laughs> there were a number of people over the years who were Baba's leading disciple, better than all the other disciples. So he was one of these. Yeah. You know? So in 1932, yeah. he was not considered an avatar. Baba had <laughs> not... Because it says the sayings of Sri. Yeah. Shri is a glorified idol, like Mr. Right. He hadn't declared himself as the avatar yet. Yeah. In fact, in the 1920s, even his own disciples would call him Shri. He hadn't yet explained the 
difference between the avatar and the, the sadguru. And of course, in India, <coughs> sadguru is used in many different ways. So it really, Baba clarified these things as he went, out, went along. Now, when he first came to the West on his very first visit in Devon in 1931, Baba did, on a walk, did tell his disciples then that he was the Christ. He did say so. But he didn't tell the public. They would say he's Christ-like, things like that. But he never spoke to the point. Baba didn't actually declare himself to be the avatar until 1954 uh, in Hamirpur. Before that, many people in his, among his disciples knew it. Upasani Maharaj had said he was the avatar when Baba left Sakari in 1922. So there were people who knew, but Baba hadn't declared himself as such. And Ward, uh, Jean Adriel published her book with the title Avatar. Avatar, I think in the late 40s. That's right, 46, 47, yeah. which seems like a pretty broad hint. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, not that Baba repudiated it, but he didn't present himself yeah. as yet. Yeah. And in fact, it's in her book that uh, she talks about in 1932. They were traveling um, by train. Baba had arrived in New York and was coming out to Los Angeles, uh, where he met, that was where he had those spectacular meetings with the Hollywood superstars, the, you know, Tallulah Bankhead and all those people. And while he was, of course, Meredith Starr, as I just mentioned, was Mihir Baba's most important <coughs> disciple. I'm putting that ironically. And it was a writer. And he fancied himself to be quite a great poet, too. And uh, Malcolm Schloss, who had been Baba's host along with Jean Adriel in New York, was also a poet and a writer. And they were meeting each other for the first time. So we've got a great setup for a conflict here, right? <laughs> so as they were on the train going out to California, Baba would dictate notes on the messages he wanted to give out here. And he gave both Malcolm and Meredith took the notes and both did their own write-ups. And consistently, Baba liked Malcolm's <laughs> Meredith's, <laughs> which I'm sure infuriated Meredith, who probably looked at Malcolm as someone infinitely beneath him. So here's a case of how, see, Baba got these messages written up. And check them out. They're in the book, Early Messages to the West. They're mar marvelous. Absolutely marvelous messages. So, but in the course of having them written up, Baba was, you know, playing this game with, you know, ego grinding game with two of his disciples. <clears throat> but I've noticed to anticipate from the early 30s until the end of his life, Baba's messages are all um, really good. I mean, really well written. And yet, there isn't any disciple in the picture over that. It's not like Baba had a, a ghost rider or something like that. He would use all sorts of different people. But with all these people, he would always get a high quality of writing out of them. He would actually write it up. Just, I don't know, Margaret, have you ever thought about that, being in the writing line? <laughs> <laughs> Looking at something 1932 versus, say, the everything and the nothing in the 60s. It, it's very consistent, you know. Or his messages say the universal message. Whoever did the messages in 1932 wasn't involved in the writing of the universal message in 1958. The same people weren't there. But, so Baba had a way of getting what he wanted. I love the universal Lord, I, I noticed message. also that some of the sentences in the universal message were first given by Baba in the 30s. In fact, he, in fact, the amazing th the amazing story yeah. Yeah. that when he was on the boat about to <coughs> land for the first time in America, yeah. and the boat was held up for a long time because there was a customs officer creating a lot of trouble, yeah. and Baba said, uh, and and the man scoffed, saying, you know, he was he was perplexed that this guy had this alphabet board, and he said, and, and you're you're going to use that to teach people in America, and Baba said, I have come not to teach but to awaken. Yeah. It was his answer wow, to that now. Wow. Wow. You know, some of those sentences he's been brewing for a long time. Yes. Yeah, the, it'd be interesting to study that. I've noticed that phenomenon, too. I hadn't with the universal message. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, early messages to the West. We published this Mirababa's classic 
six messages delivered during his Western tour of 1932, as well as two other books of his material that were published um, at that time by, uh, edited by Herbert Davy. Yeah, Herbert Davy, yes. Yeah. But now, and during the 1930s, um, Baba's work with Westerners was very central, actually. Um, and his work with film and uh, the Hollywood world. Um, and he had begun his work with the Mad Musts. And in the late 30s, uh, the, he brought Western disciples over to India for the first time. But it was really at the end of this time that Baba, uh, end, where the end of his 30s tours business, the Baba really turned to literary things again with the Mehra Baba Journal, uh, which probably many of you are familiar with this. And this is really the beginning of the story of the discourses. They, uh, we have minutes of the, um, meet, uh, the first meeting of the editorial committee uh, that oversaw the publication of the uh, Mirababa Journal. Um, I, Buzz and Wendy Connor sent me copies of them when I was working on the revised sixth edition of the discourses. And uh, Baba was present, but he sat and listened and let his disciples carry it on. At this time, he, uh, I think they were in Bangalore, and uh, there are a lot of Westerners who were staying there and Indians too, so it was collaborative. And uh, they said, it, this is about the discourses now, we're coming to the discourses. Uh, they said, in fact, there's a story that Narina and Elizabeth had gone to Baba. He wanted a magazine like this, high quality, regular, once it starts, don't stop. Um, but uh, in it, um, they said, but Baba, if we don't have something from you, it's not worth doing. You know, we have to have something from you, Baba. Yes. And, and he agreed to do it. Apparently, he had already been dictating some of this to some of his Indian disciples. I guess they didn't know that. <clears throat> I don't know, Ghani or... I, I'm not sure who. I haven't yet had access to the source materials. But some of the... So some of the stuff may have been given up by him before that. But once the Mirror Baba Journal started... Every issue had a discourse by Meher Baba. Some of them have two. And the Meher Baba Journal, like here's the okay, illustration of the first issue. Right here. So it, it would always begin by Meher Baba's discourse. Okay. Yeah. The Avatar by Sri Meher Baba. An editorial by the Meher Editorial Committee explaining what the purpose of the magazine would be. Yes. Um, the Mad Ashram by Dr. Abdul Ghani Munsef. He's one of Baba's close disciples. Very brainy, very witty, very lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Played by David <laughs> next weekend. Yes, okay. I Typecasting. <laughs> the Vaishnavite yeah. saints of southern <laughs> India and their hagiology by C.V. Sampath Iyengar. He was, um, after the mere message came to an end in 1931, another magazine arose in its place. It's called the Meher Gazette. Do you have them here? We have Meher Gazette. <laughs> not the Meher Gazette. Okay. <laughs> That's who an needs, online publication. Who needs the Meher Gazette? Meher Gazette, I think we don't have in a bookstore, if that's the question. No, well, I wasn't really aware of this that Gazette. I'd forgotten about it. Yeah, 1931 to 1938-18. It's one of the uh, early publications. It was much shorter uh -huh. than the mere message and not as substantial, but it's a very significant uh, series, actually. And it was edited by Sampath Iyengar, is his name, who uh, was a judge in Madras and really was one of... Baba really seems to have had the highest admiration for the guy. Okay, Vaishnavai Saints. Sri Meher Baba Impressions by Narina. Poems. I don't know who this is. Dinesh Nandini Chordia. Appreciation of Sri Meher Baba by Dr. Frederick Kettner. Somebody looked him up and he's, I think, a, was a well known fellow at the time. I don't know anything about him. The G1 Mukta is Above the Law by Dr. Deshmukh. 
Sri Upasana Maharaj's visit to push reporters by Adi. You can see the sort of articles there would be. A lot of them would be about Baba. Some of them would be about topics of general spiritual interest, like Vaishnavite saints. These would be the worshippers of Vishnu. And in India, um, the Vaishnavites would be the ones who worship, say, Krishna and Ram as the avatar, that kind of thing. So this gives an idea of uh, what kind of thing there would be in the uh, Mirababa journal. And the, uh, there would be like 80, 100 pages. Uh -huh. Did you have a question? I, I was just trying to relate uh, this to the timing of Baba. What year was this? Like this began you know? in November of 1938. November the first 1938. issue. Okay. Yeah. okay. Sufi Thoughts, Versification by Ghani, Sri Mirababa mm -hmm. Interview, Here's something by Ramju, Abdul Karim yeah. Abdullah, that's Ramju, oh. like that. So, uh... Shok. Hmm? Shok, that's the name, Shok. Oh, Shok. I don't... Shok. What does that mean? Shok means overjoyed. Huh? Yeah. yeah. The ultimate happiness. That's what Shok mm -hmm. is. It's really I interesting see. name. That'd be interesting. I should look. By the way, the first six issues are up online on the Trust website now, mm -hmm. so you can uh, read them or download them from the <coughs> And the very first, you notice the very first of all the discourses was the Avatar, actually. You know, in the various collections we have, um, it's not first. They, they reorganized it and put new, uh, the new humanity first. But actually, the, so Baba Hedden said he was the avatar, but his first discourse was on the avatar. And apparently, um, I think Baba had asked Chanji. You know, Chanji was his secretary, Baba's secretary, and a very, very close disciple, really a wonderful disciple of Baba's, um, to send a Mirababa journal to Mahatma Gandhi. Chanji was often the medium of contact between Baba and Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, uh, so Chanji sent him this, and uh, Gandhi reacted, didn't like it. And though the reason for his reaction is not explained, I would imagine it's because of this thing, Avatar, and he probably drew the implication, although it's not said, that Baba was saying he's the Avatar, and probably didn't like it, because yes. Lord Krishna is the Avatar, who does this mere Baba think yes. he is, etc. I would imagine that was a problem. So when Baba heard about this, Baba really took it out on Chanji. You donkey, didn't you know it better than to send him another issue or not this? <laughs> Poor Chanji would constantly get beaten up by Baba all the time. <laughs> that was part of his role. But so uh, Gandhi didn't like it. But here's a story that I heard from Eric Nadell about um, Narayan Maharaj and this first discourse. You know Narayan Maharaj, right? He was uh, one of the five perfect masters of Bhavos. He, he would um, live like, he dress and comport himself like an emperor. He had jewels and he had rajas and so forth as his disciples. Mm -hmm. Upasani Maharaj was the opposite. He wore a gunny sack and would drop it if he wanted to shock you, <laughs> that kind of thing. Right. And Narayan Maharaj was the opposite. Well, uh, this uh, when Eric Nadell and Bob Street and several others went to uh, Kedgaon Maharaj's ashram, probably in the 70s, um, there was a disciple, a personal disciple of Narayan Maharaj's who was still there, uh, Joga Lekar. Mm -hmm. And Eric said this... Eric said he could have been God realized. He was a most impressive person. A great, very clearly a great disciple of Maharaj. And Maharaj and uh, Joga Lekar, this, who was Maharaj's, Upasani Maharaj, uh, Narayan Maharaj's secretary, English secretary. Because Narayan Maharaj apparently didn't know English. At least I infer this. So, uh, Baba sent, I think, the galleys. You know what galleys are? They would have, galleys would be an initial printout of, of, a, of a book or a magazine for proofreading and stuff like that. 
So when it's all been checked, then they would print out the final thing. So he sent the galleys of this uh, first issue to Narayan Maharaj. And uh, Narayan was very excited when he got it. And he gave, gave it to Joga Lekar to translate into Marathi. And not all of it, but selected items, including this one on the avatar. And Joga Lekar said that he was constantly bugging him. Have you finished yet? When are you going to be done with the translation? And uh, when he was done, when he read this out, the avatar out to uh, Narayan Maharaj, um, uh, Maharaj was thrilled. I guess he would behave in a very excitable way. He was very short and he would stand up, wonderful, like that, you know, this exuberant, enthusiastic reactions to this whole thing. And when it was done, he sent back a message uh, to Baba. And I forget what it is, but wonderful, very good publication, My Love and Blessing, something like that. So this very first discourse was shown both to Mahatma Gandhi and to one of the perfect masters. <laughs> <laughs> with contrasting reactions, it seems. So this is how it got started with the Mirababa journal. Like this is what it looked like, the avatar, the uh, volume one, number one by Sri Mihir Baba, explicitly attributed to him, would look like this. Um, here we have, uh, by the uh, Mihir Editorial Committee, it was, uh, you didn't have to be one of Baba's disciples to contribute, other people could contribute. They, their intention was to get it out to a general public. Of course, the circulation was very limited, as you can imagine, not many people would be interested in this kind of thing, but it did get out to some extent. Interesting. Yeah, and so it came out every month. And if you look through them, they're very consistent. Do you have a set here, the Mirababa journals? No, but uh, you in know, we may have one or two. In fact, I'm glad you said that. We should look them up. You know, because Sherry R. Press did reprint uh, the first 12. No, but I've seen a few copy here. I just have to locate it. You know, John Page used to have uh, all of the manner messages, uh, I think, or a lot of the manner messages, and a lot of the, the journals also. I don't oh. know if he still has those. Oh, oh. Huh. So they're, they're, they're really, people. if any, if you can get a set, their value, keep treasure them. Are they online, you said? Uh, the Avatar Mirabova Trust is starting to put them up online. PDF? Mm, Most. They're PDF form. They're not facsimiles. They're... Okay. Uh, they took digital images and um, reflowed them so that they would be searchable. I personally would like it if the trust would also put up uh, similarities of the originals, but they I wouldn't be searchable in the same way. That's, I think, the reason. No, I'm saying if we were to publish some of the articles, you know, how mm -hmm. is it available? The first six of the, of the you know, that would be November, December, January, February, March, April of 1939 are, are up. Right? Good. Yeah. Good. Thank you. And they have these discourses in them at the start of each one. And uh, there are a couple of them that have more than one discourse for various reasons. And the Mirababa Journal continued from uh, 1938, November, through October 1942. That's four years. And uh, they never missed an issue. So that makes 48 issues of it came out. And then um, it was discontinued. By that time that Bangalore Ashram had been closed, originally Elizabeth uh, was the editor of the Mirababa Journal. But after about a year or so, she and uh, Narina were sent back to America. So Dr. Ghani, uh, took up. So this is another job for you, David. <laughs> and uh, uh, to uh, uh, edit it. And uh, of course, others were involved too. And um, But this was during World War II. And uh, there are all kinds of difficulties and shortages in World War II, including paper. It was becoming difficult to get paper. So uh, a after um, the October issue was discontinued. Baba said, stop it. <laughs> Baba would always do that. He would start things and he would stop them. I've always liked that about him. He didn't clutter <laughs> things up 
with keeping things going beyond their time. Do you so, get the cue why he stops it at, at what particular time? Well, he would always give a reason, like in this case, paper shortage. Oh. But oftentimes, the Mundali felt there were the real reasons were other than that. Yes. He would uh, close an ashram. Yes. He closed the Maribad ashram in November of 1926. He shut it down and, and tore down the buildings. Yeah. And the excuse he gave is that the Mandali weren't enthusiastic enough about the way they were doing this work. <laughs> the work. Then he did the transaction after. <laughs> and then after a month, he came back and started it all up again. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think there are Padri and two others. In one of the combined diaries, Baba is saying, you guys, you're not putting your heart into your work. You're not trying. You know. And I'm sure Baba had been ragging them to the nth degree. Wow. And after driving them crazy, Padre Bibi was a bit, you know, surely in one of his responses or a little bit irritated and loved what? What's this? You don't want to obey my order? Well, let's close Maribah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, Baba would have another reason, and this would just be an excuse. He would do that all the time. I've always thought the reason he did that was to keep it from getting stale. I do think there's a lot of that. He would shake things up. Right. You know, when it gets it gets to a certain point, it becomes more growth than right. inspiration, yeah. and then it just it's actually a burden. Baba would just never let that. Like when he went to Hollywood, I've always thought the Hollywood Bowl stunt where Baba was going to break his silence over international connection radio <laughs> on the, the Hollywood Bowl. You know. <laughs> Baba on the radio, right? And but he was going to go to China first for one day, and you know, bear in mind, in those days, that was kind of an extraordinary thing to do. He had to take a boat. He was going to be one day in China. It's sort of like this curious, quixotic master behaving in ways that nobody could understand. So he'd go, and then he would come back and break his silence. And halfway to China, he sent back a telegram saying, um, "I'm not going to break my silence as." Uh, described by me because the circumstances aren't, aren't proper for it yet, something like that. And it sounds like, you know, everybody would say, well, that's because he made all these big promises about when he broke his sons, all the stuff that would happen. He can't do it, so he's coming up with an excuse. Universally, it would be received that way. And all the people who had been praising Baba to the high heavens not all, but a great number would then dump him, trash him beneath their feet. And his disciples would have to undergo the humiliation of everybody saying, you're still following that fraud, that phony, because he wanted to get rid of it. That's why he had done his work with those people. <clears throat> he had completed his connection with the Hollywood scene, and he didn't want a lot of hangers on. He wanted real disciples who would stick to him. So it's like you fill up you know, a nice bucket with water, the bucket's full, you turn it off. So that was the method he used. So Baba would do this sort of stuff all the time, all the time. If he wanted his next, his next advent, if we want to stick to him, you know, he shakes. And if you don't hold on tight, you're thrown off. So that's what, all that. So he um, had uh, all these discourses. <clears throat> there are 51 that got published. And um, I should make reference to some of my notes once more because I think all these things. You're doing fine. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, so actually, um, Baba, the um, Buzz and Wendy have um, some of Elizabeth's, and Elizabeth's archives. And, among those papers, they have some of the manuscripts that were used for the Maribaba Journal. And uh, for a lot of them, Baba would personally initialize a manuscript to signify its approval. And it would actually be ticked off. So Baba seems, now, maybe Baba had them read out to him, could be. Or maybe somebody started reading at a certain Bob, time point, Baba would say, fine. Or else maybe Baba just initialized them without having them read. We don't know, actually. But in any case, Baba took this uh, magazine very seriously. The Meher message 
from 1929 to 1931 that I mentioned, edited by uh, K.J. Stewart. From the very beginning, Baba said, I'm standing aloof from this magazine, right from the start. Uh, this publication by Santhak Ayangar was not, it's not it was, he was a wonderful disciple, but it didn't have the quality of material, actually. It was much thinner. But with the journal, Baba really said, I want this to be a really high quality publication. And it appears that Baba took it very seriously and personally supervised it, its publication, not just his own articles, but the other people's stuff too. So, uh, let me see. Now, I had found. Um, Here's a little bit of what Dr. Death, the primary author, the primary, I won't say author, sorry. the primary writer. Uh, you see, Baba wouldn't typically dictate a message word for word. That doesn't appear to have been. So this will bring us back to the question we were bringing up at the start. Why didn't he? If he had just given it word for word, we could say this is Baba. So what, uh, why didn't he just do that? And, Simplify it all um, for the posterity, but he didn't. Um, he would dictate points to someone, and then that person would take the points and write them up into a uh, full write up. And then Baba would go over it, and it would appear in the case of the discourses that at least the impression I received is that a lot of people were involved. It was they were gone over very carefully, and. Uh, if it was read back to Baba, Baba might say, no, 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 that's not right. Correct this. Or, But a lot of things Baba doesn't seem personally to have cared about all that much. A lot of the stylistic matters he would leave to the writer concerned and would let them express things according to their own style. That's how it looks to me anyway. Balna too would talk about this somewhat. Um, but Baba... Uh, was dic dictating um, one of the very first Adi Kearani. I think Adi talked about that when he came to L.A. I got um, CDs of some of his talks back in 1980 or something, 79, here in uh, Los Angeles. Not at this center, of course. Whatever. Was there a center in 1970? There was. Was it that other one over in um, Santa Monica? Was, Monica. Monica. was that there in those yeah. days? The, the history of the listener, in fact, we started reflecting on it. It started from Pasadena, it started from Hermosa Beach by Alex yeah. Oreskes, then John Page in Pasadena, then Santa Monica, and now here. Yeah. So, Baba, anyway, uh, Adi was talking about this, and I found some of this on a uh, CD of his talks there, and uh, he Baba had dictated. I think the discourse on selfishness. Adi was the primary writer of that one, but Adi said to Baba, "I'm not a writer. You need to get a writer." And uh, Baba said, "Well, who do you suggest?" And he suggested Dr. Deshmukh. <coughs> and now some of you know De Did any of you meet Dr. Deshmukh? Yeah. I did too, just briefly. And uh, he was a professor of philosophy yeah. at Victoria University. He got, a, I think, his PhD in London, which is a real distinction in those days. Yeah. He was a very, a lot of the stories you hear about Dr. Deshmukh are very funny. He was a very eccentric sort of fellow. He was, if the, you know, the architect, the, you know, the absent minded eccentric professor, mm -hmm. if the, if the, <laughs> Absent-minded, eccentric professor archetype should ever have an identity crisis. All it needs to do is look at Desh, Dr. Deshmukh, and it will be reminded of what it should be. He was the very paradigm of it. He was a Eric used to. I think think he was very funny. I think all of the Mandali did, but he did a brilliant job with this. Absolutely brilliant, and he was. Uh, first encountered Baba, actually, before meeting him physically, encountered him in a vision. And I found uh, Glenn McGreeny sent me a little tape. I think he was first in London. In London. He was in London. He met Baba in London and before that had a vision. 
<clears throat> above it, actually. So I, I take him at his word, actually, and I take him at his word in this, and this I transcribed from this tape. So Dr. Deshmukh was saying on this tape, it was my great privilege to be associated with the editing of Avatar Meher Baba's own discourses. Dr. Gunny Munsif was editing the Meher Baba journal, and it was the desire of Avatar Meher Baba that at least one article by him should appear there, means in every issue. So articles had to be prepared out of the explanations which he gave. And he had given me several explanations. And several explanations were sent to me also. And often, when he would, and then something was missing, he would invite me. He used to give me ex explanations which were recorded by me. Sometimes the points were sent to me by post. All these were arranged by me and written down, typed, etc. Baba used to take up my consciousness into his own. Oh. And it was his mind which was working when these discourses were being edited. Oh. See, he says it. Yeah, yeah. 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 And you he know, says... with many people saying things like that, I say, okay, so you say. Right? You know, people <laughs> can be overly excitable. Yeah. But you know, in the case of Dr. Deshmuk, I buy it 100%. Yeah. Because the result testifies to this. Yeah. I think this is exactly what happened. He was no abecedarian. An <laughs> abecedarian. And the master transmitted directly. Yeah? So it's abecedarian, uh, not abecedarian. That, that's what I think it is. We can look it up. But. Let's look it up, yeah. yeah. In each article, personally checked by Baba, and sometimes corrected before it went to press, proved of, and sometimes even corrected before it went to press, this there's something got garbled there. And each issue of Mayor Baba Journal, and it's unintelligible, must be contained one article of Baba. I do not think I was associated with the first discourse. Accepting the first discourse, I am associated with all the other discourses. And what Adi said was that the, dis the second discourse, the discourse on selfishness, mm -hmm. was written by him. And I have also heard that he wrote the discourse on love. Those two by Adi, the rest by your day one. Baba has been working through me so far as the discourse work is concerned. And it is all Baba's, not mine. Yes. Baba has done it. Myself, I have just been instrument in it. This is what he said. And I buy it 100%. And I think the result testifies to that. So this is, um, now there, I, I have heard, but I not, I never could pin it down, that a lot of other people were involved. You know, we'd go over it and check it or correct it or stuff like that. So it could be the, that Baba's ashram was heavily involved in reworking these, mat these materials. But the primary work was done by Dr. Deshmuk. And from the bottom of my heart, I honor the man for the magnificent work he did. In fact, he appears to have been the uh, primary writer that the Avatar used in this advent. He was, um, God speaks, he wasn't involved in, that was uh, Eric. But uh, a life at its best appears to have been based on his material. Beams was done by him. I don't know if you know the book Sparks of the Truth. Yeah. They have it. Yeah. This is going to get republished now in a, in a new critical edition. This is a lot of... Actually, when it got republished by, by Phyllis and by um, Sherriard, they took out all the sidebars. Mm -hmm. But all those will get restored and some of the original readings will get restored. Mm -hmm. Well, that's by Dr. Deshmukh. He's the author, but it really... I think is a very highly significant and authoritative book. It's by him too. So I, I think he would be the primary writer that the Avatar used in this advent. Very interesting. And so he was the main writer of the, out of all the souls in creation, mm -hmm. this was the one whom the Avatar picked uh, to do a lot of these things and discourses would be hold the front place among all of it. May I ask a question? Yeah. It's always in my mind. So 
when you say a primary writer, I, all, I do believe that what he said, that his consciousness was actually taken by Boba and through his consciousness, yeah. words were... But also, I, I always go back to what I learned from you about the history of God Speaks last year, mm -hmm. how Boba would look at the editing and re-editing of the work. Oh, yeah. So wasn't it the same about the Shmuk work? You know, we don't... I haven't yet found actual accounts, first-hand accounts of how it was done. Okay. But surely it was so. Yes. Surely somebody would give it to Deshmukh and then Deshmukh would come or I'll send it, read it out, and Baba would nod and say, no, no, that's wrong, correct yes. this. Or, uh, you know, Baba would really, Baba would be very particular on matters of substance, matters that he really <laughs> cared about. He seemed to give the individual writers a certain scope stylistically. That's yes. what it looks like to me. Yes. He, he wanted them to do their best, and that would entail their using their <clears throat> abilities. So he gave them that scope, but he um, he would not miss things. Yes. That's what I take to do so. Yes. And maybe Baba went over these a number of times. It, it very well could be. It wouldn't surprise me a bit. Yeah. You know, Baba was most meticulous. Mm. I don't know, a lot of you all, I certainly had the, this kind of experience with Erich, who was not Baba, but boy, he had an uncanny way of catching things. Uncanny. And I'm sure that was, here's one example of Erich, and I, with Baba Mohan, a million, I think a Glimpses of the God-Man, the third volume by Balma II, came in. And I was there at Erich's desk, and uh, he would always start at the back and go to the front for some reason. <laughs> and you know, his glasses, he had this disastrous cataract surgery that just about destroyed his eyes. So his glasses were about that thick, right? Mm -hmm. So he would sort of look at it. What's that? Typo. What about that? Typo. I saw with my own eyes in about two minutes. I think they found five typos in the whole book. He found three or four in about two minutes. Erich did. It was, and that wasn't the only time I saw him do things like this. I don't believe there has ever been a better proofreader than Erich. It was like supernatural how he would do it. Because he had the ability in any situation, if something was wrong, zoom, he would go right there instantly. He had a, I don't know what you call it, knack isn't enough. Okay, well, Baba, multiply that by an infinite degree. So, I'm sure Baba was very particular about these discourses. But that's not to say that there aren't mistakes. There are. There are some that go through so the earliest publication of a lot of the discourses happened between 1938 and 1942 in the Maribobo Journal. Okay. And now what was happening concurrently with this uh, was that uh, each year, they, uh, Adi, Adi was um, the one who would publish Baba's material in those days. So they would collect Baba's discourses from a whole year's worth of the Mayor Baba Journal, like November through October, <clears throat> November 38 through October 39. They would take out Baba's discourses, just that, and publish it separately as its own volume. And uh, so by 1942, uh, or actually it took it until 43 to get it published, there were four volumes, right? Each year, Baba's discourses were collected. So there are four volumes. And then the Mayor Baba Journal was discontinued in October of 42, and they published a fifth volume. And I would presume, I've never seen this explained anywhere, but it would make sense, that these were discourses uh, that Baba had given out, but that uh, um, hadn't been published yet when the Mayor Baba Journal was yeah. discontinued and they were still there. So they just published a fifth volume with, with the extra material. So all told, we get up to 69 discourses published in five volumes. 
So if you've heard of the five volume set, um, what that is, you see what it is, is the collected discourses from the Mirababa journals comprising four volumes and a fifth volume also of stuff that hadn't been published there between 1939 and 1943. So that's how the complete discourses were first published. Five or four? Up to five. 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 Four from the Mirababa journals and a fifth with discourses that never got published in the Mirababa nice. journals. So 1939 to 1943 was the five-volume set, it's called. Um, these have been published, um, put online on the Avatar Mirababa Trust website, the five-volume set. Refloat again, not facsimiles, but trying to keep, unless there are typos in the reflowing process, but verbatim uh, reproductions of um, the five-volume set. So this is how the discourses first got published. Now, okay, so that's the first edition. You all with me? We're going over the history of the discourses. So uh, between over the next 10 or 15 years, um, various of these five volumes would go out of print. And uh, so erratically, uh, they got republished. Um, Erratically means if a volume went out of print, that one volume would get reprinted, not the others. And uh, they would call these reprintings new editions. Mm -hmm. uh, so there'd be the second edition and then the fifth edition. They wouldn't even have a third or fourth, say. So the number of the edition is really not very meaningful. And they're not actually editions. What they are is reprintings. Mm -hmm. So when we hear about the first five editions, they're, they're just reprintings of the original thing. Now, I will admit, I haven't gone through every single, you know, reprinting or edition of the five-volume set to compare in detail. I've done some of that. That'll be a <coughs> project for somebody. Some of them, it looks like the type. You know, back in those days, you know, they didn't have, you know, Macs or, you know, you know these computers that we have now. They would, um, you know, I've forgotten the terminology. Maybe somebody knows better, but the type had to actually be set. It was cold type. Cold they type. Choose each letter. And put yeah, it put it in place. Box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it all had to get done that way. And when you look but at they did it. They did it. Yeah. I took I took printing in high school. So can you imagine the proofreading that's involved in that? My God. And some of the reprints, it appears that the type all got reset. And it would make sense that it would, because otherwise you'd have to keep what they call... You can't keep the type, because it's all in letters, and you pull them. Yeah. And you finish printing that, and then you put it away. And you put it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they'd have to do it over again if they wanted to reprint. So, so then you'd have other types. Right, right, other things like that. <laughs> but as far as I can tell, when they reprinted, usually they tried to reproduce exactly. There are some cases where they edited a little bit, and I don't know who did that. Deshmuk or Baba, I don't know. I, this needs to be studied. If anyone gets interested in this topic, um, the fourth volume of uh, the revised sixth edition of the Discourses has a, uh, an appendix here, it's, um, I mean, I really killed myself to do this. Um, hours on the phone with Jack Mormon and people on the phone. Mm. Um, towards a publication history of the five volumes set. And this gives the most complete, it has a table of all the different reprintings that I could find of each of the five volumes. If any of you ever can update this or find corrections or <clears throat> any further information, I would really welcome it. I was just working with what I had at the time. So this is uh, the earliest phase of the publication involved uh, this first edition that got uh, reprinted volume by volume up through 1955. So when you hear about the sixth edition of the Discourses, it's a bogus name. They <clears throat> See, there are five volumes, and then, um, let me pull this up. 
it, it's just sort of a conventional name that got established and no one wanted to change it. Like volume one, there's a first edition, a second edition, a third edition, and a fourth edition. Okay, volume two, there's, there's first, second, third, fourth. Actually, in fifth, this one there are all five. The third volume is the first, first edition and a fifth edition. Volume four, one first edition and a second. <coughs> volume five, there's the first edition, the second edition, and another edition that isn't numbered at all. So it's kind of erratic. <coughs> and edition, as I say, really means reprinting. They weren't true editions. An edition is where you actually take the text and fundamentally re-edit it or do something maybe with a, at least with a new presentation, a new introduction, you know, index, something like that. And often the text will be altered in some kind of way. That wasn't done for the five volume sets at all. So those names are, are bogus. But then in um, 1955, after Baba declared his avatar hood um, in... Um, Hummerpur, and gave messages, actually it was before that, like the highest of the high, and mm -hmm. began to proclaim himself as the avatar of the age. That very period in the 1950s were when his most important books came out, like God Speaks was published in 1955. Uh, I've mentioned this before, but it actually got released in November of 1955, at exactly the same time that Baba was having a Sahabas at Maribad with some of his Indian personal, Indian uh, close devotees. And that Sahavas was meant to be no discourses, no intellectualism, just the exchange between lover and beloved. That was the kind of the rule for those Sahavases. At exactly the same moment, God Speaks came out, which is <laughs> philosophy, impersonal, nothing <clears throat> personal at all, um, formless God. Yes Transcendental or no. God. Hmm? I say yes and no. Yeah, so you get both. At you the same both. historical moment, you got both opposites from Baba. And I personally, like many others, would count God Speaks as Mihir Baba's uh, most important book, although the discourses rank very high too. But during that same decade, uh, then um, Life at Its Best came out, which was a collection of messages Baba gave in his 1956 tour of the West. Beams from the Spiritual Panorama was published, um, and that was based on questions. I think it was an article in the Globe, wasn't it? Yeah. About yeah. that, <clears throat> with a lot of the questions yeah. that yeah. the yeah. Sesame was on. I haven't I seen it yet. I've heard about it. I'm very good tomorrow. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Deshmukh was the primary writer Baba used for that. Listen, Humanity uh, was published. Ira Dietrich helped with that. Hmm? Ira Dietrich actually helped with putting that together. It's in a globe. Yeah, with that issue, yeah. The original book would have been before Ira was in the yes, picture. Right. Yeah, no, Ira was probably the main author of this article like, recently. But um, it, Listen, Humanity was published, and it includes uh, discourses of Baba's that Don Stevens compiled from material Baba gave him at the 1950. By the way, in uh, Australia this year, we had a uh, three-day seminar on uh, Stay With God. And next year at Mirana, we're going to have a nine-day program focusing on Stay With God. And that resulted... <coughs> from an order Baba gave to Francis Brabazon at that same 1955 Sahabas. He gave Don the order to write a book or to compile a book, which resulted in Listen to Humanity. And he gave Francis the order to write a book and he gave him the title, Stay with God, which Baba said was second in importance only to God Speaks, as a matter of fact. So, this period was dynamite when it came to Baba giving messages in books. So right during this very same period um, was published a new edition of the Discourses, God to Man and Man to God, by, edited by Charles Purdon. Mm -hmm. Do you have it in, in your library? Which one? God to Man and Man to God. 
Yes. Yes, we do. It was. Would you like to, <coughs> oh. you like to see a copy? If somebody like could bring it, I could sort of show it just to. Yeah. And if you have the sixth edition, the three volume set, and the seventh edition, that'd be good too. I can't carry these in my suitcase now. The weight, the weight is too much. Yeah. Well, that's the sixth edition. Here, can I <coughs> just brandish them? Everybody. This is the sixth edition. Three volumes. When I first came to Baba, this is what was available. Yeah. And the revised sixth was deliberately designed to look look much like it. Which you did. Yeah. <clears throat> but the, the uh, God to Man, Men to God was published, uh, you know Charles Purdom? I don't know if you know that, uh, you've probably seen Bob's <coughs> Uh, message, the Paramount um, film yeah. message in 1932 at the Davy household, at Kitty's parents' house. Trina Herbala has come to the West to deliver, you know, that very dignified British gentleman. Thank you, thank you. And, all, and of course, the, the book Godman. The Godman was, was really, written by him. Yes. This is the republished yeah. Sherryar Press edition. That was republished in 1975 or so, and it's out of print now. It really needs to get reprinted. And uh, um, this is from the library. Yes. Know. So this contains the same content as this one. As which? As these? As the sixth edition? Well, it was edited by Purdom. Um, it's an edition of the discourses. It is that, um, but it has. I went through and counted it, and of the 69 discourses in the five-volume set, and in that also, there are 60 here. And also, you really have, he's rearranged it, so you really have to go through it closely to figure out that this discourse is this bit, bit of material and it's that. Also, um, Herdom's editing was um, severe. Put it that way. Mm -hmm. He would really chop things mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. He would cut out a lot. Um, so some people like it. I personally don't, don't like him. Don't, don't like it. I don't like his editing. I have great respect for Purdom. I think his introduction to this is one of the best introductions ever done to a book of Baba's material. But in his editing, he would really chop out a lot. He was kind of of that generation. Uh, any of you who have been involved in literary study back in the, with Ezra Pound and that whole uh, generation of writers, they were highly critical of Victorian um, ornateness and embellishment of style and wanted a severe simplicity and if there are two adjectives, <coughs> cut it down to one and reduce everything. That was kind of the style. And so Charles Purdom was um, of that school of style also. So he approached the discourses in that way. But there are some people who really like it, um, who came to Baba through this edition. And I do say it's an edition of Baba's discourses. This is uh, how it happened. Um, so we're talking about, okay, the history of the discourses. So notice that Meher Baba, the author of the discourses, allowed these things to get rewritten over and over again. Okay, so the... Uh, Charles Purdom was in contact with uh, some of the most distinguished publishers in Britain, and Britain was very highly regarded. Uh, you know, the publishers were, there was still a, a great <coughs> deference towards the British publishers, in, even in America at the time. And uh, Victor Golantz was one of the um, very respectable publishers, and Charles Purdom had connections with them. So Charles said to Baba, wrote to Baba, that he would have thought that the discourses needed to be presented to the Western world. Because if you look at the five-volume set, they're not the kind of thing you could sell in the West. You know, these Indian books just wouldn't cut it. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> you know, they're sort of thin, flimsy covers. and or They actually had hard covers, that's, that's not true. But they, they're not up to the kind of printing standards the West commanded. But he said that it would need to be re-edited. The writing style was too ornate. 
um, for the West. And Baba had the question relayed to Deshmuk, and Deshmuk said he didn't want it. So Baba said, no. But then after a, a couple of years, Deshmuk relented and said, okay, go ahead. And uh, Chuck Purdom went ahead and did a re-edit. And uh, I heard from some uh, that uh, it was all read back to Baba, Charles Purdom's edition, and Baba gave his approval to it. Oh. So this appears to be an actual, authentic, approved edition of the discourses. <clears throat> it's greatly pared down, uh, but it is an edition of the discourses. Yeah. You know, that brings me the, this question to me because there are some very good Baba messages in Persian book, God Man. Oh, Even yeah. Even messages about new life messages and so forth. So are they being chopped off or are they really what Baba <coughs> mean? That, that I guess I don't to know. Baba. But yeah. one has to say, Perdon was a great scholar. He was the first from the literary world to present Baba's message to the West. Yes. He's not someone to be taken lightly, in my opinion. I have great respect for him, but I, he there. I, if we were talking about him, I could give examples of things that he really cut too much. He cut out things. He cut out things that were essential. My I see. That's my view. But everybody can have his own opinion on this. So this will be the second primary edition of the discourses, very greatly edited, more um, severely edited than any other edition has uh, ever done. Now the, uh, let me see, I'll put this up, here we go, yeah. By the way, for those of you who may not be aware of it and who are interested, um, all of this that I'm talking about now has been presented in the fourth volume of the Revised Sixth Edition in A History of the Discourses. And it's about 70, 80 pages and goes through this entire history closely. Fourth volume. The fourth volume, yeah. Um, so in uh, this whole story of the sixth edition, Sam's three-volume set we just showed to you a minute ago, mm -hmm. that looks a lot, the, the revised sixth was deliberately done in such fashion as to have the same general look. <coughs> uh, per, uh, Don Stevens had the prerogative to visit Baba uh, whenever he was in the neighborhood, means Asia. He would, uh, or Africa. <laughs> he was working for Standard Oil, so he would fly over to Saudi Arabia and places like that. And uh, when he was there, he had the liberty to go visit Baba, like at Merzat. He was one of the very few. And... Uh, he was, uh, um, Baba one time asked him, Don, what are you doing? Are you doing anything more with my words? And uh, Don said uh, that, well, Baba, you know, he had groups that have been studying Baba's discourses and said there's a few, some people feel that they need to be re-edited. And he was working with Deshmukh's version, the five-volume set, not with Purdom's. Uh, Don and Ivy Deuce and uh, Charles Purdom um, were kind of uh, critical of each other, let's say. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they wouldn't have cared for Purdom's edition. And uh, Baba said, oh, is that so? And mm -hmm. uh, uh, Don said, well, this is related in more detail in this essay. You know, they feel that though Deshmukh, uh, you know, grammar is fine, but there are places where his wording could be simplified. Mm -hmm. so, oh, what do you think should be done about it? <laughs> and I said, well, Baba, you have a lot of followers who'd be very skilled and go through and uh, you know, work on it and do a new edition. And Baba said, you do it. <laughs> so uh, he got the order from Baba to do a new edition of the discourses. And uh, he worked on it for a number of years. And um, the uh, result was the sixth edition of the discourses, it's called. As I said... It was called the sixth because some of the printings of the five volume set said fifth edition. It's bogus, but still, in deference to that, they called this one the sixth. 
So there haven't really been six editions of the discourses, right? Um, and it was in three volumes. It was printed in, um, in Japan. Uh, Ivy Deuce is a, a co-editor along with Don Stevens. And uh, for those of you who may be interested in this essay, let's see if I can quickly, a lot of this whole history is given here. Uh, the sixth edition. Like here, for example, on this page, um, I put up some of the examples of the kind of editing that, that Don did. These would be examples of more substantial editing. For example, in the uh, five volume set, this is Deschmuck's version. This is exactly the point in respect of which married life is utterly different from promiscuous self sex partnership. Uh, the Don Stevens version. This is precisely why married life is utterly different from promiscuous sex relationships. <clears throat> Many psychic capacities, this is Deschmuck's earlier version, uh, which are latent in the human soul. And this, this unfoldment increases the scope and the range of facts which can come within the can of human consciousness. And the edited version. Many psychic capacities which are latent in the human soul. This unfoldment increases the scope and range of human consciousness. It's that kind of thing, you know, it's like that. It changes in the wording, you know, simplifications in the wording, streamlining. Um, so left is this more, right is done? Yeah, this is the sixth edition and this is the five volume set. I just made this table out of some representative examples, the kind of editing that's done. Yeah, it is right, Don is right. It's nice. It's simpler. It's simple. It's simpler. It's simpler time. But, you know, one thing I would say is it's not really that big a deal. Yeah. It's not that big a deal. Yeah. If you care a lot about stylistic matters, um, you'd be interested. I'm interested. I, I'm in this kind of thing. But, you know, there was a controversy about the seventh edition of the discourses we haven't come to yet um, about 10 years ago. Actually, Marshall was saying this to me, who just passed away. And he was saying, my God, I spent lived my whole life according to the seventh edition. But now I find only the sixth edition is valid. <laughs> you know, it's, it's small stuff, actually. It's not very important. But the question comes up, so I'm just telling you, this, this is what we're talking about. You really want to know. Now, there were some substantive... Marshall, uh, can I pose yeah. a, a simple question here? Yeah. My understanding is this. Tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Basically, Bob approved of the fifth edition when it appeared, and yeah. the sixth edition was came out, and he approved of that. Is that right. correct? That's right. Thank and you. the seventh edition was published after he right. dropped the body, and therefore did not get his approval. Right. So there's a real question about that. I'm not dismissing yeah. that question. The seventh was published by who? We'll get to that. We're still. Okay, I'll sure. come to the seventh in the next. Um, Wait, are you saying this is slightly different from the three volume? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. That's the seventh edition. Can yeah. you hold it up for everyone to see? That's the seventh edition, mm -hmm. one volume. It was published in 1986. So that was, uh, we have, we're mm -hmm. right now in the sixth edition in 1967, three volumes. Very nice. And uh, there are, this essay gives another series of examples of some substantive changes that were made in the sixth edition compared with the five-volume set. Now, Don Stevens said that Baba had a folder of corrections um, that he wanted incorporated. And I was emailing Don about all of this, and he didn't know where the, that list was. I would still like to see it. But he presumably incorporated the sorts of corrections that Baba indicated. Here's, I don't know if it was in that list, but here's an example of the type of correction that needed to be made. In the uh, original form of the uh, essay Avatar, we looked at that earlier, right? The Avatar. Um, it says there are always at all times 56 Sadhgurus in the world. Okay. Now, when Baba was on his Andra tour, somebody asked him, but Baba, you said that there are five Sadhgurus, <laughs> but here it says 56. And Baba said, 
No, no, no. There are always 56 God-realized souls. Yes. So the Sadhguru's was clearly a mistake. Yeah. Somebody misunderstood it. Yeah. Or originally, Baba would use Sadhguru to mean a God-realized soul of every type. And in the 20s, he said that. So maybe that got carried over. So in the sixth edition, that got corrected, for example. That kind of thing. That stuff like that was there. Um, and I, I did come up with a list of a number of noteworthy changes. Actually, to get away from Maribod, where harassments are abundant, I went to Kuna and checked into a hotel for about four days. I did it a couple times, and I must have spent 150 hours. And I went through the five-volume set and the sixth edition and took detail. I have 100, 200 pages of notes. And the vast majority are comma here, no comma there. Oh, you know, stuff like wow. almost everything is like that. Mm -hmm. And I have really detailed notes on the changes. And so the stuff put here is illustrative of the most significant kinds of changes. Usually it's stuff nobody would care about except for people who are very interested in style. And I am, actually. And some people are. But most people wouldn't care very much. So this got published in 1967 by the Sufis, Sufism Reoriented, um, and um, the sixth edition. The sixth edition, three volumes, yeah. and it went through five printing printings. I think two of those printings were after Baba dropped the body, and uh, in those printings they would correct spelling mistakes and stuff like that. Little little changes are made. Um, so you will find some of that, like. Impossible. I M P O S S S I B L E. Well, obviously, even though Baba dropped the body, do we have to make it a three S impossible for the next seven years because we can't alter the correct spelling mistake? So they didn't do things like that. Now, in uh, nineteen uh, in the eighties, uh, the Avatar Mayor Baba Trust. Uh, oversaw, actually I don't know if the Avatar Maribod Trust was formally involved, to say that Baba's Mandali um, at Maribod Mirzai oversaw a, another edition, the one Esther was showing, the uh, sixth, seventh edition. And uh, there's, in the introduction, there's an explanation of why it was done. But in addition from, to that, uh, Peter Nardine, who many of you will know, has a memory. He was living at uh, in India at the time. And he said that one day um, he was in the, uh, the office, the trust office at, at uh, Maribad, at um, uh, Kushu Quarters in town. And uh, Mani was there. And she, there was a project to re edit the discourses. And Mani was saying, Well, why are we doing this? Mani wasn't one of the editors, actually. It was Erich, Balna, too. And, like Chris. And she said, well, we would never have done this on our own. But um, when the sixth edition came out, the three volume set, uh, Baba gave it to me and asked me to look, look through it and say what I think. So then several days later, um, Baba said, well, what do you think about it? And I said, well, Baba, Don Stevens has done good work. But out of deference to Dr. Deshmukh, he didn't go as far as he needed to. He needed to edit a little bit more. A lot of what he did was like breaking long sentences into two parts, say. Or if the language was a little bit archaic, he would modernize it. That sort of thing. Um, and Baba said uh, to Mani, yes, that's true. Wait until Deshmukh has passed away. <laughs> and when he's passed away, do a new edition. And in the early 80s, Dr. Deshmukh passed away. So I would presume Peter is the only one who remembers this. So it's dependent on one person's memory. But Peter has an extraordinary memory. But, but they did start to re-edit. And what they did was more or less um, what Don had done, but taking it a little bit farther. They um, shortened sentences. They broke paragraphs into shorter ones. They standardized the language a little bit, where it had been um, uh, a little bit elaborate. Um, they made several substantial, I'll say corrections, um, or important changes. And here are some of the most important. 
in uh, God Speaks, for those of you who uh, you know read the book closely, um, nirva- the term nirvana, you know nirvana, is used to designate not God realization, but rather the experience of the final fauna, the divine vacuum, the divine vacuum state. The ego, the, the ego, it's maranash, the mind is annihilated, but you don't have the I am God experience, you experience the divine vacuum. But in the sixth edition of Discourses, Nirvana is used to mean God realization. <laughs> Actually, oh. check it out and you'll see. There are similar pro- questions are there with um, Nirvakalp Samadhi and Sahaj Samadhi. The usage of those terms in the sixth edition of Discourses is inconsistent with the usage in um, God Speaks. Mm. So, I, I, apparently, um, the editors, Eric Flagg and uh, uh, Wellna Tu, went through and observed that and changed those terms. There's a substantial revision, in fact. One of the discourses had its title changed and made it consistent with God Speaks. So that's one of the biggest changes. And I want to say we would never do that now. And I'm not criticizing Erich, obviously, but I don't feel that any more editors have the authority to make changes like that. But what to say, Erich... If Erich is doing it, I'm going to say he had the right to do it. Yeah. Okay, just, I didn't get exactly. Which one is consistent with God Speaks? Which edition? The seventh this edition one? That one. was made consistent okay. with God Speaks. And the sixth edition is inconsistent. Right. But, it, you know, Don was going around, you know, just talking about the inaccuracy in seventh edition. Da, yeah. da, da, da. Yeah. So there's this a limit of mental con- the consciousness in, uh, well, for us about seventh edition. I want to know which yeah. is is it okay? I mean, if, <laughs> I, I want to know if it's okay to carry that thought that seventh edition is not. Well, you know, if you hear what poor Marshall so traumatized <laughs> <laughs> probably caused his death twenty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> Yes, there was also some rearrangement you of know. some paragraphs. You're right. That we picked up on. Yeah. Oh, it, you noticed that? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, right. One of them involved? in particular, a paragraph got moved the, about a page and a half. the paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? So you guys saw that? Why are you reading both editions? Neat. Yeah. And comparing, huh? Yeah, yeah. What about the Sahaj Samadhi and Nirvikalpa Samadhi? I always took them to be synonymous. Is that not the case? Uh, no, they're not. I see. In the in God Speaks and in the uh, seventh edition, Nirvakalp Samadhi is the I am God speaks. Yes, yes. And Sahaj Samadhi is the experience of um, I am God and creation consciousness concurrently. Uh-huh. So a perfect master. Uh-huh. So Sahaj, Sahaj Samadhi is really beyond Nirvakalp Samadhi. It's, yeah. I mean, it's another stage. It's yeah, that stage. would be the fourth journey or the tenth yeah. state of God yeah. or the ninth state of God too would be Sahaj Samadhi. Oh. And Nirvakalp Samadhi would be the eighth state of God. But in uh, discourses, that is not so. It's used in a completely different way. I think Sahaj Samadhi, now I always forget this, I think Sahaj Samadhi is the I am God state. And Nirvakalp Samadhi is either that or um, the I am God and I am creation state. So the meanings got quite changed. In uh, By the way, in the revised sixth edition, in the... Uh, Fourth volume. It was a glossary, and it, it explains all of this, all these terms. This is the most complete. Which is wonderful. This is the most complete glossary, and I can say because I used all the others, <laughs> incorporated everything in it. Okay, good. You know, and I tried to explain. In the seventh edition, it means this, and in the sixth edition, it means that. And God speaks Great. that. All of these. Are, are so good. this glossary breaks it down and has both. Both usages. Yes. Okay. It will. Its primary purpose is this sixth edition, but when that differs from the seventh edition, that's explained. And there are some other terms. I put in some of the terms from God Speaks. It looks to me like some of the terms in God Speaks got misused, actually, mm. by Ghani in the back. So I tried not to put it in a harsh way, but I tried to indicate that it's at variance with some of the Sufism terms. If you find mistakes in this, by the way, please 
you know, call attention to them. Don't. All of this will be superseded in due course. You know. This is done by a Sherry Foundation. They published it. Yeah. Published it. So we buy it from there. But they're selling much more than seventy edition. I'm not know. So you know. Yeah. People are already in this. So the seventh edition got published in '86 by Sherry Press, which is now Sherry Foundation. And um, in the early 2000s, about 2003, for the first time, I was working at the press then. We were working on infinite intelligence. I know we need to wrap it up. That's yeah, five minutes. It's ready, so we okay. never need to stop. Yeah, okay. Another Thank five you. minutes. Yeah, sure. Um, we got uh, communications from people in the U.S. critical of the seventh edition. And there is a very valid point being raised, actually, saying... Who has the right to rewrite the words of the avatar after he has dropped the body? Yes, right. That's a fair point. Mm -hmm. I actually, and there's no denying that that scoundrel Erich <laughs> and his cohorts did that. <laughs> yeah. And I'm being facetious, yeah, obviously. Yeah. But they did, they did do some revision of Otto's words. So the question came to the trust as the copyright holder, actually. And we formulated a, a policy on this. And the policy is this, that as a general rule, and the seventh edition we count as an exception, as a general rule, when Baba's words got published, actually got published during his own lifetime, um, with his evident knowledge and approval, and with his name on them as author, those three things, during his lifetime, with his evident knowledge and approval and with his name on them as author, we won't re-edit, except in essentially trivial ways. Yes. And here's an example of trivial. Um, mm -hmm. Impossible with three S's. Subject-verb agreement. Um, uh, things like that. Uh, capitalizations that are inconsistent. Like uh, when I was going through the sixth edition, Self-realization, the realization of God, capital S hyphen lowercase r. But there are like five cases where it's smaller case S, lowercase r. I studied every case in detail, and there is no difference. It was just an inconsistency. So I capitalized it. Things like that. That only, those such changes only can be made. There can be no further re-editing of things that uh, were published in his own lifetime. And because otherwise, where do you stop this? Yeah. If people start rewriting Baba's words, where do they stop? You know? um, but in the case of the seventh edition, um, we made an exception, and much of the reason is that Erich was involved. And I don't know I, what to say about that. He had that intimacy and knowledge of Baba. And also we have the story from Peter Nardine that suggests that Baba had asked for a new edition to be done. They did a new edition of God Speaks after Baba dropped the body. And in that case, it's completely clear that Baba wanted that to happen. But no more re-editing of things that were published in Baba's own lifetime. Now things that weren't published, um, the trust policy is that they can be re-edited. Because a lot of times all we have is diaries, or memories, or Eric Germani talking in Mandalay Hall, they wouldn't be pretending that Baba said exactly those words. What if the diary was written, here's a case of a diary, that Baba's disciple Bailey um, uh, knew Baba in the 1920s, and he wrote diaries at the time, and then he lost them. And in the 1960s, he rewrote them. Okay, so he's writing in the 1960s, something that he remembers from the 19-teens, when Baba was probably talking in Gujarati. Obviously, no one would imagine that these are literally and exactly Baba's words. So with our infinite intelligence is another case. If you want to look at the original manuscript, it's completely unreadable. In these cases, following Baba's practice, the trust does allow them to be re-edited on condition that the originals are always publicly available, mm. and the original sources are the primary texts, and people can always go back to them and do new, better editions if they want to. The published editions are presented as the best that 
could be done at the time, but they're not definitive and authoritative. That's the trust's policy with respect to Baba's words then, right now. What about, just quickly, the authors who would be using Baba's words or the code or passage from Baba in their publication and the validity of well, the version that they yeah. would be using? What about that? That's no, trust as, has any as to saying the about discourses, that? As to the discourses, the decision that the trust made about this, we have these editions, as I've just reviewed, the five-volume set, right? That's the same as uh, the Mir Baba Journal. Those are incorporated into it. There's Charles Purdom's God to Man, Man to God. There's the three uh, volume sixth edition, and there's the seventh edition edited by Erich, volume two, and Clyde Chris. Those are the four editions. Um, the trust took the position that um, it will not make any decision as to which of those is the best. I see. People can use whatever they choose. Okay. That's not to say that there isn't a best edition. Maybe there is, but that's up to Baba's lovers. The trust is the copyright holder won't decide that. Then but there is a further online. editions won't be allowed. And let me just come to the revised sixth edition, since this is um, uh, another thing in the picture. Because this controversy arose in the, uh, you know, 2003, 2004, there are really kind of bitter feelings among some people on the subject. Yeah. Um, and the sixth edition was out of print. Uh, so we decided, we came to this decision, any of these four editions are legitimate editions, no further substantial re-editing. But uh, because the sixth edition was out of print, we reprinted it. And while doing it, um, the reason for this fourth volume partly was to, to provide a way of speaking to these questions, of having a history of the discourses, yeah. so we could study materials. This um, Various other things, like um, this quote from Deshmukh that I gave you, a quote from Adi, a history of the five-volume set. Um, uh, there's a glossary, there's an index, and uh, also, I won't take the time to put it on the screen, but uh, this is a practice we're trying to institute. Is um, there's a what's called a register of editorial alteration. I think I will show it to you just because these actually are going to be important matters in due course. Is it here? Let's see. Yeah, here. Here's an example. I know you're just gonna. Run and right after this, go and read it. This is the part you're going to want to read. Um, wow. What this is, is... This is in fourth volume? Yeah. And I did this. For every change that, that was done in the revised sixth edition relative to the sixth edition, um, it's marked here. Oh my God. Every single what change. What work you've done. You know, <laughs> like... Uh, I tell you verses, no, I tell Parabhakti, you. Parabhakti. This is capital, this is not. Oversoul, oversoul. This has a hyphen, this hasn't. So if anybody wants to say, yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I was not helping prepare the yeah. lunch. But um, did you address in this part of the conversation yeah. that that volume that was all in one book that... Yeah. So what, let, me, let me finish my question, please. Thank you. People do that. But anyway, uh, the political correctness that was done, which was really annoying to me, I just felt like, why yeah. did they, is that something that you addressed? I didn't talk about that as yeah, kind of a also topic. Was, there was some political. It was more the king, the king's English, so it was yeah. never him or her, it was he, yeah. and et cetera, et cetera. And um, I felt like, why? Not just leave that alone. Mm. Uh, uh, Baba approved the discourses mm. yeah. that that he uh, with with his information in it, mm. and why can't we just trust that? But then the way you introduced the whole topic this right. morning um, right. gave me pause to think that maybe some people would 
to have well, a serious problem with leaving it the way it was. I did. I have more of a problem that it was changed. Well, actually, I personally share your view in that I don't, and here's a principled reason, that what motivates that is there's an ideological component to that. And uh, I don't think that Baba's words should ever be revised for any kind of ideological reason. And let, like, let's suppose one, I actually wrote an essay where I brought this up. I gave an example of abortion. Okay, I'll just do this real quickly. Let's suppose you have two editors, one who is um, a right to life person and one who works for Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about where Baba talks about not use of any birth control. And one might revise it where this is a suggestion not to use birth control. And the other might revise it to say, you absolutely cannot use any kind of birth control, and this prohibits abortion too, which is a form of murder. Do we want people doing this with Baba's words? No. no. So leave them alone. Yeah. So that's part of the reason for the trust decision. <clears throat> there was a bit of political correcting in the seventh edition. Okay. So it happened, Eric's name, when he was approved of it, no more re-editing of Baba's words, except in ways that are completely unobjectionable. And if you have any questions about it, that's what this is for. So like, let's suppose, um, one aim, comma, viz, period, comma, one aim, period, comma, viz, period, comma. If you go wild about the deletion of that period, okay, well, you can bring your case to the world. How many people are going to care? <laughs> but if like anyone, more. if anyone wonders, here it is. Here it is. Sam's in trouble because he's been using the uh, unrevised. Oh yeah, after unrevised. That, you're probably going to fall back to stone state. <laughs> yeah, I've <think> already. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Just yeah. to understand this, so on the left column is the Jamie revised Poo. sixth edition. Yeah. And then the right one is the sixth edition. That's right. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Very minor difference. Yeah. But it's good. In counterpoint, I think that some might see the, the English, uh, King's English change as just more of a modernization of freshening up as opposed to an ideological statement. Yeah. However, one sees it, I think the simple thing is leave it alone. <laughs> and, you know, people can deal with it. It's like, Right now, if you wanted to read the Bible, you'd have to learn Greek. So, if somebody wants to come up with a version, or an explanation, or an interpretation of it, that's fine. Identify it as such. But, how do you stop it? Once people start changing this, and then they'll change that, and then they'll change the other thing. Some people like might say, this isn't ideological, this is just modernizing the language. And somebody else says, it is ideological. There'll be no end to these kinds of wars if people start rewriting the words of the avatar. Anyway, that's the decision the trust came to. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. Well. Thank you. Thank you.